Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining us at the 2020 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Bobby Rizzo. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our panel, Moving the Chains, Advancing Football Analytics. Our panelists today are Brian Burke, Senior Analytics Specialist with ESPN, Alec Hallaby, Vice President of Football Operations and Strategy with the Philadelphia Eagles, Mike Leach, head football coach for the Mississippi State University. And the panel will be moderated by Mina Kimes, a senior writer, podcast host, and commentator for ESPN. The panel will be 45 minutes in length, and we'll save 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so on Twitter using the hashtag MoveTheChains. The questions with the top mentions will be selected by the moderator. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mina. Where are you from originally? Wisconsin, Madison. Great. Hi. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, I was hoping we could start off by having each of you just do a quick introduction saying what you do now. Uh, Brian Burke, ESPN uh, analyst, uh, mostly specialized with player tracking data these days. And uh, uh, before that, I ran an old website you might have, you might remember, Advanced Football Analytics. And this, I think, is my eighth conference, maybe my fifth time on this panel. I'm not sure. I'm uh, Alec Halby. I'm with the Eagles. I've uh, been with the Eagles since 2009. Work with our GM on football decisions, primarily player evaluation, roster strategy, oversee our quantitative function. And I think I was at the first Sloan in 2006, and then I've been back periodically. Not on panels, though, not like Brian. <laughs> uh, I'm Mike Leach. I'm the head football coach at Mississippi State University. and uh, and. Uh, I've admired these guys over the years because they're very clever people and, um, and try to learn what I can as I go along. But uh, one way or the other, you better do, just do the best you can, so. I like that. Um, cool, well, I, I think the place I want to start is by talking about something near and dear to all of our hearts, especially you, Coach Leach, which is passing the football, the emphasis on passing. Um, we're coming off of a Super Bowl in which the winning team led the NFL in pass percentage in neutral situations, something that uh, a lot of the people in this audience like and espouse and want, something I think that you also like and espouse, and, and something I think you've seen trickle up more into the NFL over the years, this emphasis on passing and efficiency in passing. And I want to start with you, Coach. What has it been like watching some of those principles you've sort of espoused or endorsed or embodied for a long time make their way into the NFL more frequently? You know, I think that <clears throat> how I've always looked at it um, is as a coach, you're always looking for an efficient way to run an offense and an efficient way to score, an efficient way to move the ball. If you have a quarterback um, that could uh, throw strikes, um, you can make six positions better. The quarterback's position and the other five, uh, the other five skill positions uh, better. And um, if a guy just runs and he is not consistent at throwing the ball, he can be really good. And then I think the misdirection between him and the running back, you can make the running back better because they don't, you know, as in who's got the ball, who doesn't. So. Um, you know, so then you're at one and a half. Well, um, I've always been at places where you better have every advantage you can possibly get. And, um, and so I've always liked quarterbacks that can hit the targets so, because I want to make six positions better. We typically lead the nation in passing. We may not this next year. I, I think we will, but we might not. And then, um, but we usually do. And, and, um, um, and, if, and, and if we do that, we're doing a pretty good job of making six positions better. And, and then one thing, you know, people talk about, you know, running back. Our running back uh, nearly always has the most yards because he's closest to the quarterback. It's easiest to get it to him. And, um, and uh, you know, some of you guys that, uh, MIT, I mean, uh, I mean, I did a lot of good things academically, but, you know, slide rule and math and, 
you know, some of this MIT stuff, I wasn't quite qualified for that, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how many people in your classes are from Cody, Wyoming, probably not very many. But um, the thing about it is, is, is uh, if you can get it to six people instead of one and a half, um, uh, you know, you have a better chance of moving the ball the way I look at it. You think you'll have to change anything in the SEC West? I don't. Um, I don't. You know, everybody does the uh, the deal where, well, you can't do this, that, and the other thing at this league. I've found, I've found that you can do about, you know, if you can do it in high school with rare exception, I think you can do it in any league. You know, they say, well, you get in all the debates, and I've been in all the debates, you know, and 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 you know, despite my pleasant demeanor, um, I, I, I don't have a huge problem arguing with people. And, um, and so, so the, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, you can't do it in this league because all of our corners are like Deion Sanders. Well, they're not, okay? But as long as we're gonna go that route, okay, well then all my receivers are Jerry Rice, okay? Then they go, well, but, you know, our uh, defensive linemen are all Lawrence Taylor. Well, they're not, okay, but okay, then my offensive lineman is Anthony Munoz, you see? Yeah. And, 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 and so there's a point where it balances out, and if you can do it at one level, you can do it at the next. And, and you know, when I was at Texas Tech, uh, that was the Big 12 South, or that, that, that was the, the SEC West then. The Big 12 South, I mean, You'd start out each season in, um, uh, you know, Oklahoma and uh, Texas would be in the top five. In the top ten, you'd have Nebraska, Texas A&M, Kansas State, and whoever was good out of Missouri, Oklahoma State, and uh, uh, Colorado. And, and, you know, we'd not play one or two, and then, we'd, uh, uh, and then we'd lose to one or two, and we'd beat the rest. And so I think it's a very similar situation. Alec, how have views on run-pass balance evolved since you first came into the NFL? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the ideas probably from my early to those early 2000s teams, they haven't, um, they haven't come up wholesale, but certainly, I mean, you can see it looking at the Chiefs this year, and Andy's always been a guy who's been very pass-heavy. He's always been oriented that way. You know, Andy and, Andy and I are both BYU guys. It's funny because... Um, when like I, LaBelle Edwards stuff? Well, when, when I would go to the practices, we'd see the same drills. I'd look at the, the there, you know, there's Andy out there. Uh, the same drills look like, you know. Yeah. 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 So I think a lot of those, um, I think those views have definitely changed over time, probably in the direction that analytics and analytics type people and data driven people would like to see them to go, but certainly not, um, not universal around the league. Like there's still a large, uh, large difference in run pass rates across teams, across situations. Um, so, yeah, not everyone, they're very few. I mean, no one is passing it as much as Mike, basically, right? right. So, no one has done that be in the league. Well, I, I want to kind of say that for a second because I think it's easy for us to point to the Chiefs and say, see, like that works. Pass, you can pass when you're down. They have Patrick Mahomes. New right? England's been, now, you guys are all New England fans, right? I mean, Boston, I mean, we got the MIT. I, I, I mean, the last several Super Bowls have been air raid principles. I mean, it, you know, come on now. And, 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 um, and uh, nobody likes to throw up much more in New England lately, and, and they didn't start out that way either. I want to go to you, Brian, quickly. On, I think there is a misconception or perhaps a perception sometimes that analytically inclined folks want to pass it 100% of the time and get rid of all running backs and kill the running game. Yeah. What do you think is the actual sort of analytical view of running the football right now? Yeah, uh, well, <clears throat> a lot of times people will cite some particular counter examples, some anecdotal examples. So Baltimore's a really good running team or San Francisco's a really right. good running team this past season. But they have the luxury of doing that um, because they have a great pass defense, right? They're, they're, they're not, they don't need to score a lot of points to win the game. So, and they're, they're leading games traditionally in the second half, so they can run a lot. They don't need 
um, big chunk plays as often as teams who are trailing. So, so that's what I say to the counter example. It's still the passing game that's driving what you're seeing with these successful running teams. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, it's, it's real simple. Uh, just do what you do best at, right? Just do that more often. And uh, you don't really need analytics to tell you that. But, you know, we, we've, we've done the math and, you know, we have expected points and we know that teams should be, you know, passing more uh, outside the red zone and running more inside the red zone. So, um, you know, it's definitely changed, but it, the change has happened ever since 1978. So big rule shift in 1978 and the league has been catching up to those rule changes. They still haven't really exploited the passing game, I think, as full as they, fully as they could have. Mm. Um, going back to sort of what you're talking about with quarterbacks and sort of how you run your offense, again, you don't always have a Mahomes. You don't always have, you know, a quarterback is perhaps the ideal quarterback to espouse some of the, or to, I think, utilize some of these ideas. Do you think that matters? Well, you know, I think there's a few positions uh, in football that are very difficult to manufacture. Like, I think it's hard to manufacture a corner. If a guy doesn't have the skills and capabilities to be a corner, I think that's very difficult to just um, to develop and to manufacture. I mean, he's got to be a certain speed. He's got to be able to turn his hips and that type of thing. Same with the defensive end. Same with the running back. I think you can develop a quarterback. I think you could, um, you know, I think providing he's got certain capabilities, I think you can coach your way into a quarterback. And I know that it's a key position, and I know that it's the kind of a revered position. I think you can coach your way into a running back, and I think you can coach your way into a receiver. And with all the things in sports and, um, you know, in my case, football, that you don't have control over, you better take control over uh, the things that you do. And um, I think you can coach your way into a pretty good quarterback, but you do need a guy, and this is what I look for, um, is he accurate? You, you don't just take a guy that's not accurate. He's got to be accurate. And I get a kick out of this. I, I watch colleges do it. I watch NFL do it. I watch their, you know, you know, so some guy in high school, he's not accurate. They say, well, you know, all he's got to do is work on his accuracy. Okay, well, then he'll go all through college. He's still not accurate. And, and, and you know, colleges will think, Okay, the, the kid since junior high is not accurate, but they're going to be the guy that's going to make him accurate. Okay, then, and then. Um, Have you made a quarterback more accurate? Oh, yeah. Oh, you can do it? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. No. I, <laughs> that's what I meant. That's what no, I meant. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I yeah. Get a guy that's accurate. Yeah. Hell, the shortstop's accurate. Get him. Yeah. And, 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 and um, but, 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 you know, they'll, they'll do these evaluations. They'll say, all he has to do is work on his accuracy. Well, that's not something you just work on. And, um, you know, his high school coach couldn't make him accurate, then he goes to college. College coach couldn't make him accurate. Somehow the NFL is going to magically make him accurate. Like hell they are. They're not going to make him accurate. And, 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 and so I think you start out, you need a guy that's accurate. And, 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 and it troubles me to say what I'm about to say. Because, you know, as coaches, you're a teacher, and you try to teach everything that you can, and, you know, something as fundamental as accuracy, you'd like to be able to see, say you can teach it, but I don't know why it is. It seems to me that somewhere around sixth grade in the backyard, either a guy's accurate, accurate or he's not. And um, I, I don't know exactly why that is. I mean because you can develop a lot of things and you can improve accuracy, but you can't go from non-accurate to accurate, uh, particularly consistently. And so you start out with the guy that's accurate. Then does he make good decisions? Now you can affect that coaching wise. Okay, then does he have quick feet? And I've always viewed it this way. Uh, Joe Montana had quick feet and could maintain space in the pocket and provide extra time to throw the ball.
but he wasn't particularly fast. Steve Young was fast, okay? Fast, not, maybe not as good in the pocket, but fast as far as taking off, like broken play, here I go. Okay, then how strong's your arm? Now think about it carefully, and in, in, in Patrick Mahomes is challenging this notion, but as far as having all five of those capabilities, the NFL Hall of Fame is full of quarterbacks that were great at elevating their offensive unit, that were great at, at making the players around them better, that did not have all five of those things. Most of them have three. Patrick Mahomes might have all five. Brian, we were talking yesterday about how hard it is to quantify quarterback play. Yeah. And I think the evolution of some of the statistics we use, I mean, how we've, we've gotten smarter going from, you know, dumb stats like passer rating to QBR to now we have player tracking data that allows us to get a better sense of that. What are you, what are we trying to get at? I mean, Coach Lee talked a little bit about some of the qualities we're looking for in quarterbacks. From a statistical yeah. standpoint, like what do you want? What is the perfect metric? Yeah, no, uh, <clears throat> quarterback decision making, Coach mentioned, is, is really hard to quantify. Um, but with player tracking now, we can, we can do some certain things. We can start to peel apart the onion and start to look at uh, you know, quarterbacks who can um, uh, avoid bad decisions, they're making the right reads. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, if you could kind of capture that or quantify decision-making ability in a quarterback, you'd probably, you know, you'd be a millionaire many times over. Like that's the holy grail of, um, you know, finding good prospects, right? Like you can measure their accuracy, you can measure their foot speed, you can measure, you know, their height and hand size, every, everything else about, you know, a quarterback's arm uh, athletically, but it's such a cognitively loaded position that, you know, it, it, and it's not necessarily just like IQ, or if you have a high SAT, it, it's something else. It's some psychocognitive ability that, that some quarterbacks have, they have it, and some quarterbacks don't, don't have it. And if you could put your finger on that, uh, th that would be worth a lot. And so with the player tracking data, we're, we're starting to, to answer some of those questions. It is still hard to decompose the, you know, we can look at the, the realized decisions, but then there is right. that gap between what the play actually is, what the intention is supposed to be, and what they're being, co is this a progression read or is there an alert on this play where there's, you know, if the corner on the backside is playing off, they're supposed to go to that. And then you look at that play, play out, and you're thinking this guy on the front side is wide open, why aren't you throwing to him? Well, it was, you know, it was coached in that way where the preparation was, we're gonna throw this if we get this look. Um, so that's still hard, you know, that's still challenging to decompose. I'd say a, a lot of these, a lot of the quarterback metrics you're trying to, control for context and play and defense and isolate the quarterbacks, um, you know, what the quarterback is doing, what he's responsible for. So, you know, that, that, he, yeah. That's tough to evaluate because, uh, you know, different quarterbacks are coached to do uh, different things. Right. And what did you say, cognitively loaded or something like that? Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna start using that. I mean, <laughs> that cause that's term. outstanding. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, listen, Bubba, you're not cognitively loaded enough to play quarterback here at Mississippi State. Now, whereas he is very cognitive, I, 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 that's no cognitive load is like is like task load. It's the other way around. I well, I think that's outstanding. Like I mean, you're standing, uh, you're standing in the pocket, rushes in your face. I I, yeah. I have. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's what's great about this conference and this panel is is uh, you'll learn stuff you never even thought of. But anyway, so, so, so you guys are getting your money's worth just on that alone. Okay, but, but um, uh, what I think on these, uh, um, uh, you know, quarterback's a funny position. If you think about um, the NFL with rare exceptions or the draft or even college, um, you know, the positions where you can just flat out measure out. Like, we're like running backs typically come from big schools, okay? Like, like you know, well, well-known schools because you can figure out, okay, who's fastest, who's strongest, you know, who gets yards, okay? Uh, uh, D linemen are generally like that too. Okay, quarterbacks, if you go through 
the history of the, the, the NFL, in, co in college for that matter, but college is harder because high schools are all shapes and sizes, but um, quarterbacks have come from big schools, Division three schools, one AA schools, and, 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 and the reason is, 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 if, is if you have the skill set, which I kind of described already, um, the, 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 the intangible that he's talked about, the cognitive part, and that's a hard word to say for me, uh, and, 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 and um, is uh, uh, you, you can, the, the ability to elevate the other 11 around you is the single most important mm -hmm. skill the quarterback has. Can you elevate the other 11 players? Can you do it at a key time? Can you do it consistently? Can you do it without pointing fingers? And I hate finger pointers, and I'll break them of that too. Uh, um, yeah, and it finger point, I, you, you know, that, that, we got a sand pit for that. Okay, and then, and then um, uh, but the, the, big, the biggest thing it, it, it is can they elevate the other 11 players around them? It, it, and, and you can develop that skill at all different levels and divisions uh, of, uh, uh, of college, okay? And so if you look at the end, like Kurt Warner, right, you started one year, one double A, okay? And, 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 and his story's outstanding, and I'd like to know him. I shook his hand, but that's it. He has big hands, but then, uh, uh, um, you know, he, he's one double A. It was going to go Division three, one double A. Then uh, uh, um, starts for one year. Then he goes to Arena. Then he's stocking shelves at High V. High V is the, the grocery store in Iowa. You've probably never been to a High V, and and uh, and that's the grocery store in Iowa. Well, then he's MVP. That kind of gets into the season a third of the way through. He's MVP of the Super Bowl. I mean, uh, um, but the ability to elevate the people around you is the single biggest skill that a quarterback can possess. I think it's also pointing to the difficulty, the variation in identifying talent at the high school level. So, like for any given year, yeah, the top five defensive line. If you look at the list of the top five defensive oh, yeah. linemen coming out of high school, those guys are going to be pretty good as pros. Um, whereas at at offensive line, at quarterback, there's, it's much harder to ID those skills. Do you find, because literally this is your job, is using this increased availability of data to evaluate players, do you find that it's helped with the quarterback, with evaluating the quarterback position? Because as we've all been talking about, I think putting number, numbers on quarterbacks is probably the hardest thing, right? Because of all of the complexity, everything you've just described, situation. I think player tracking gets us a little bit closer there because it marries a little bit of what's actually happening on the football field with yeah. the spreadsheets, but it, has it helped you at all? Well, so I think one thing to distinguish here is that like some, some of the metrics we're talking about with player tracking, if we want all that stuff, we don't have that at the college level historically, right? right? So for the last 10 years, if you wanted to evaluate a college quarterback and you'd wanted to use X, Y coordinates, couldn't do it, right? So um, I think it is the, the level of data that you have for some of the 1AA quarterbacks is very different. Um, and then there's also the problem that we run into with, with Mike's teams, where he'll have, you know, whether it's Anthony Gordon or Gardner Minshew or BJ Simons or Graham Harrell or Cliff Kingsbury, like those quarterbacks, Damn, the box score all, look, yeah. yeah. <laughs> those, those quarterbacks look very, very similar. Um, yeah. Very similar in the residue, they lead, the data that they generate, right? So then we have to figure out how much is that player? How much is the system around them? Um, are we able to actually do something that would tell us, hey, this guy looks like he's a quarterback. This guy looks like he's a quote unquote product of this system. But um, I think there's probably been too many guys that are dismissed as products of the system, right? We've seen some of the air raid quarterbacks succeed as pros. Um, you know, I think people would have probably had questions about Mahomes, about Goff, about other, you could have said the same thing about Murray last year. I, I, get, a, I get a kick at a product of the system. Right, I'm saying I don't think it's No, no, but, but you know what I'm saying because you, you kind of reinforce, I mean, you, you know, your system's supposed to elevate the ability of your team to play. You know, if you have a great running back, and you rush it all the time. I mean, your system's generated around, 
you know, what's going to move the needle the best. And if you do a good job evaluating that, I mean, uh, anybody that's not a product of the system was in a lousy system, you know. It's also structurally we have a different problem. Like Mike can have three quarterbacks on his roster at any point, or two, two quarterbacks where if one goes down, the next mm -hmm. guy comes in and they're still functioning at a very high level. Whereas the drop off at the pro level, if Mahomes goes down and it's Matt Moore or Chad Henney, there's a, there's a large gap there. So the, the yeah. scarcity of quarterback talent that can function similarly is, is very different at our level. So I, I do think it changes the game in some ways where uh, yeah. the, higher, the cost to losing that quarterback is higher. The higher you get you know, from peewee up to pro, like the bigger, the, the lower the replacement level is for, yeah. for any position, quarterback, you know, even more so. Yeah. Hmm. Mike, what do you think NFL teams miss or get wrong, I guess, most often when it comes to scouting quarterbacks? Well, that, that's difficult to say because um, that, that, that's difficult to say. No, no, no position's more scrutinized, and you guys know better than I do, but you, you, no position's more scrutinized uh, than the quarterback position. And yet um, it's uh, frequent, frequently um, evaluated uh, poorly. I mean, uh, every team has a first round draft, you know, has, has drafted quarterbacks in the first round. Yet, and, and, and you guys know whether this is right or not, but a lot, I, I think that um, there's not a lot of first round quarterbacks starting in the NFL, you know, I mean, because every team scrutinizes it like crazy. Okay, and yet, and, and Tom Brady's one example, but you know, quarterback after quarterback that is having success was not a first round pick. And they scrutinized like crazy to figure out who the first round pick was. And, um, and, and I think it's a, it's a couple things. We've touched on the, the moving variables as far as, you know, it, it's more than just, you know, how big, how tall, what he weighs, how fast. You know, it, it, it's the ability to elevate the players around you uh, that is most critical, and some, and, and a lot of that's awfully intangible. Um, is 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 really intangible, and I think that it's a very difficult position to evaluate. The best way to evaluate is do they elevate the people around them, and then you say, well, how do you evaluate that? And I don't have a perfectly good answer for that. I mean, you try to watch on film what they look like when they're ahead, what they look like when they're behind, what they look like you know, when, when, when things aren't going their way, but did some people have the ability, um, presence or whatever, to make people respond. Like Gardner Minshew played for me, and, and you could, you know, just on TV, you could watch how Jacksonville were, would respond to when he was in there. You know, just his own enthusiasm and energy elevated people. Sometimes someone's calmness and, and uh, unflappability will elevate what's going on out there. But there's, there, there's very few positions that are more scrutinized than quarterback and yet is poorly evaluated. And then I think the other thing is different coaches, well, okay, first of all, one thing, and you guys know more about this, I don't know why the hell I'm talking. I mean. But, but I mean, uh, I mean uh, um, most NFL teams, coaches don't uh, per se make the selection. I mean, it's, it's GMs, it's scouts, et cetera, that decide who's picked on a team in the NFL. Everybody thinks, well, you know, the, the coach drafted this guy. Well, in very few cases does the, the coach draft anybody, okay? Um, but different teams value different things. And I think this business of somebody values one thing, somebody values the other, the other, the other, uh, and everybody says, well, why isn't every quarterback the same? Well, different people value different things and different things are important to them. And, um, and then, then you extrapolate that with the fact that, okay, now these coaches are only gonna last two years then we're going to fire their ass because it's like a farmer throwing seeds in the ground. 
corn grows six inches and they go, damn, I thought it was gonna grow eight inches. I know what, let's pull it all out of the ground and let's plant more corn. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the craziest thing ever, okay? And I'm speaking as a coach, but um, I think people evaluate, I think people value different things. I think people get impatient in, in whether or not they have a good thing going or not, they'll change. And then I also think that, um, um, uh, you know, just a quarterback's ability, the, the intangible and how do you, and, and, and I love analytics and all that, but I don't have an analytic for evaluating what creates a situation, um, you know, or what, 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 how this guy can elevate a team different than this guy. Well, I'll, I'll challenge you on quarterback evaluation. I think given the problem, how hard the problem is, and given how kind of mysterious and black box a, a quarterback's brain is, and, and given kind of the fundamental difference, sorry, fundamental differences between college game and the pro game, uh, I think the scouts and GMs, and they do a pretty good job. I think we're all misled by the Tom Brady's or Russell Wilson's or even Kirk Cousins of the world because they were drafted in later rounds they weren't necessarily first round picks, but they, we don't really see the um, you know, dozens of late round quarterback picks who just never take the field, right. never even make a roster where they're on the practice squad. And so we don't get to see the denominator. Mm -hmm. I think you're also seeing a lot of the, a lot, so there are a lot of first round quarterbacks now that previously um, may not have been first round quarterbacks. So I think if, like, if you reran the tape and had Russell Wilson in next year's draft, he would not go where he went 2012. You're seeing well, someone like that. Lamar go right. up into the first round. So, the, you, uh, you know, the league will not get the perfect rank ordering on quarter. You can go through Mayfield, Darnold, Rosen, uh, Jackson. In any given year, they're not going to get the perfect stack, but you're seeing a lot of those picks shifted up. I, I agree that Russell wouldn't be taken. However, that doesn't change the fact that that's a mistake. Right, but then you see uh, uh, Kyler uh, uh, go. You see Kyler go at the top like of the draft, a bit of a partly as a reflection. Right, you see and, Lamar and, going round. And, and I'm not going to throw out the names because I don't want to embarrass them. But there's quarterback after quarterback after quarterback that looks like some Adonis-looking guy who he's just not a good football player. And there's right. a difference between that. And then, and that doesn't change the fact that coaches, generally speaking, not always, generally speaking, aren't making these decisions. And, and, and um, so I don't know why, and I'm a, as a coach, and I'm very biased, um, I don't know as a coach, you know, if, 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 if they're going to pick all the players on your team, some key third down situation, I don't know why they don't just turn to the scouts and say, hey, what are you going to call? What, what are you going to call this play? I mean, you know, I mean, uh, um, and in college, you see the same thing in college, you know. Uh, um, you know, they'll have, they'll rank the recruiting classes. They'll, they'll say, this guy's this good, that guy's that good, the other guy's this good. Uh, I mean, okay, and, and, and most of them are media members, you know, media people, and, 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 and the bigger the media base, the higher they're going to rank the various recruits. I mean, you know, so it follows then that I should ask them what to do on third and long, right? Well, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, on that note, though, of uh, I think, well, not Which that note. note. Nina. <laughs> I, was, I, I don't have a natural segue. I'm sorry. Um, no, but I do want to go back to what you were talking about, kind of just about Wilson and some of the misses that, you know, because if you look at those quarterbacks, right, and I think actually if you dig into some of their numbers in college, they should have gone higher. Yeah, like, he was awesome. You can, was awesome. Wilson being a great example. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask you, Al, you just left the combine. Do you feel like with, you know, granted we don't have player tracking for college quarterbacks, and I imagine that would help a great deal, but do you think uh, with the addition of some of the statistical information we do have available, uh, your job has gotten easier over the years? Um, I, I mean, I think it's gotten more interesting probably because you have more, yeah. data. you can segment players in different ways and, and look at different uh, different skill sets and get a clearer view on things. Um, it's probably shifted the amount previously. If you'd wanted to see, if if you'd wanted to see Russ in all those situations at Wisconsin or NC State, where 
the play had X and Y happening on it, you would have to watch a lot of those and go through, and then you could supplement it with some of the data. Um, and then now, you know, if he was coming out this year, you'd be able to, you'd have much more data that could help you go, okay, we want to see this situation and this situation and this situation and look at their outcomes um, against this defense or in this set or whatever it may be. Um, so that's changed a lot. I think that the workflow has changed where you used to have to watch a lot of things or you could use the data and you could only get mm. um, a certain level of specificity. With spe specificity. Now you can get very grant, yeah. That's yeah. like cognitive. I know, hard coming out. You know what cognitive yeah. means. Yeah. I know, uh, I know, so what, I mean, I know what it means. I just have a tough time saying it. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you guys something because this has fascinated me and I'd never thought of it. Uh, hand size, you hear talk, talk about hand size more and more and more. And I've had some good quarterbacks with small hands, but my better ones have big hands. And, 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 um, and then the other thing is, in my most recent thing that I got to thinking of, in, in, in a port, in, in, in a lot of it has to do with Anthony Gordon, is um, <clears throat> I've thought about visual, you know, because because uh, Gordon can see the field so well. Now he's got big eyes, you know. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I don't mean, think that it, that is something. I thought. Not, and, and, yeah, and, I don't no, think that's the but, but but let me just say this. That could be probably <clears throat> so so so. <clears throat> You know, because, you know, everybody talks about a quarterback that can see the field. And, and, and I don't know if that's a, a, something that's learned, something that's uh, just a natural talent they already have. But um, I have had quarterbacks where all of a sudden, you know, they see this much, okay? And then all of a sudden this guy can see this much, you know, where the ability to see the field is something special. And I even it, think that's related to the system. So like when I watch your teams or similar teams, you, you guys will have really wide splits and you'll have two by two. You'll, everyone will be spread across the field and the quarterback will have, literally the visual field, is it's easier to pick things up. Whereas if you're playing dense, um, if you, you know, you're dropping back and you have six in your face and the splits are tighter, it can be harder to see things. That is something, and it's something well, that Well, within that though, I've got guys that, can see here. Yeah, even within your thing. Yeah. 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 But ultimately, Brian, wouldn't we like to get to a place with tracking where we actually can sort of quantify what he's describing? Not the hand size or the eye size, but the, <laughs> you don't like hand size. the vision. The vision. Eye size is a tough one for me. Yeah, I, not to beat a dead <laughs> horse, but the, the, vision, the vision is the cognitive part, right? Yeah. Because if you're overloaded in the Navy, we called it, your, your bucket was over overflowing, right? You, yeah. So you, your brain can hold so much attention and information and you're under stress, you're under duress, and you can, uh, you can only hold so much information in, in your brain at a time. And, and so we would say, yeah, your bucket's overflowing. And we called it situational awareness. And that's the vision that you're talking about. And uh, people who are sort of like no, low in neuroticism or uh, low, there's a big word for you, coach. And, or, you know, very, very calm, cool people, like they have vision because they're not stressed, overstressed. And so they can process a whole lot more information. When your bucket is overflowing, you get tunnel vision. You just focus on that one receiver. Sure. And that's when, that's when the bad decisions come. That's when the interceptions come. And so, like I was talking about earlier, just to go back to that point, is that's the, the magical quality that you want. And the only way you really can find it now is to just drop the quarterback into the fire and see whether he turns out or not. And we think a lot about skills that can be taught and can't be taught. I think all the personnel people that have talked to you across basketball and baseball panels will think about this is a skill yeah, that right. is very, very hard to One teach. thing I learned from Coach Leach is uh, keep things simple. And if you have five core plays and some variance off those, and you just get really good at those plays, that's so much better than a playbook with you know, a thousand different plays and, and uh, all kinds of verbiage and code words and things. Um, and so that's, that keeps things simple for, for the QB and that, that helps him you know, process the information. But there can, I do think there can be advantages to the complexity too. So like one thing you may have seen with the Ravens this year, I think is the, complex, the complexity of run looks, of motions, of ball handling that they were giving. Um, that was something that defenses were not preparing for every week. And so you may spend a little bit of time on the off season and then that week you're preparing to, see, to play against option football, which you're not doing every, it's sort of the, the uh, same phenomenon you'll see in the college game. But that's an example where I think they do have this 
really, I mean, their run game is more diverse than anyone in the league. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what makes it hard. It's, it is difficult to be good at all those different things. Um, so not every team can do that. You, you, uh, you risk running into mediocrity. But. I want to put a pin in the Ravens, but I do want to ask you something about the player tracking stuff before we move on, which is how do you use it? <laughs> because yeah. I think well, uh, the player tracking. So obviously we have all this information now in the NFL. <laughs> I imagine it would be useful for you as well. But, but yeah. you know, well, from one, I think, roster construction and a coaching yeah. perspective. Um, I think, so I think Brian's group does a really good job using, so I think anyone in the public that wants to see different ways to use it, I think they do some great stuff there. Um, and that, you know, we think about it in the context of player evaluation. Um, you can imagine any sort of metric, traditional metric that you'd have for a linebacker, for a pass rusher, for a wide receiver that you would want to create some sort of, um, really we're not thinking of, hey, how can we use this NGS data for the sake of using NGS data. It's mm -hmm. more we want to capture this skill or we want to be more precise right. about more accurate in the evaluation. Sometimes the NGS can help with that. Sometimes it, it can't. So I think there are cases where we go, this, I'm having a hard time using this data to improve our accuracy on this. Um, yeah, so the other thing I, I think is that we are very much still learning how to use it. So like one of the, before the data came to the league, um, spent time talking to people around the NBA and around, the, around MLB who'd had access to the data for many, many years in, the, in their own sport. And I think one of the lessons there is that even four or five years in, they were still figuring out what was real, what wasn't real. Um, they'd experimented with metrics that they then changed their mind about. So I do think it's a process where when we talk about this three years from now, um, I think we'll have a much better idea because it is still relatively novel. For a lot of teams, they're still bringing in the people that they need to work with it. It's much, they stayed on a much bigger scale than we've used before. Yeah, I see right now, currently, there's two kind of major applications for the tracking data. Uh, the first isn't necessarily analytical. We can use a lot of machine learning uh, techniques to, say, classify plays, pass routes, coverages. Those are the kind of mm -hmm. things we're doing now. Um, and we're expanding that uh, capability into, into other areas of the game. And then that sort of reduces the, the, <clears throat> the task for your QA guys. And your, so right now, maybe a team, when they're, when they're um, preparing for an upcoming opponent, they, can, they only have time to go back maybe two or three weeks of their, yeah. their opponents. But now we can, we can process the entire league's games, classify, and just for film cut-ups and things. Just, hey, show me every, you know, uh, every time they rent, you know, did a Tampa 2, I want to see that film or something like that. So it's not necessarily making a prediction or something cosmically awesome where we're saying, mm -hmm. like, you know, Garner Minshew is a 7 and he's going to be great one day. Uh, we're not doing that. We're just kind of helping uh, reduce the load on coaches. We're replacing what human labor would need to do. It would take all night long. And we're doing that. Yeah. The second thing we can do is um, start to parse apart the individual contribution of a player. So football, like they say, it's the ultimate team sport. And that's true. It, there's 22 people on the field. And everything uh, that 22nd player, 22nd player out there is influencing the performance of every other player and the 23rd player. So you have uh, yeah. you know, thousands of different interactions kind of on the field. And it's impossible to really model that the way you could for baseball or even basketball. You, you can do it pretty well. Right. For basketball. So with the player tracking now, now we can start to do that. We can start to, to parse apart you know, the, the function of uh, a lineman who's blocking, the function of a, of a wide receiver who's going against press coverage. And so, so we're just starting to be able to do that. And I think that's really interesting and fun. So much of your work is trying to do what, exactly what you just described, which is actually identify, isolate what a player is doing Rather, for example, taking a pass rusher and rather than just focusing on sacks, you have pass rush win rate this season. And, and then you look at a player like Jadavian Clowney, who you know, only has three sacks, but ranks extremely highly in your metric. Right. What, are the, like, what are you trying to get to next? You know what I mean? Like, what's the next? Yeah, no, wait, I mean, <clears throat> everybody uses stats, right? I mean, we're kind of past this now. Right? <clears throat> Analytics is here. We've arrived. <clears throat> it's just a matter of what analytics are you using? Are you just counting stats? Right, or your sacks or something like that, or counting tackles, or, or uh, total pass yards. Those are bad stats, right? We just want to get to better and better stats. So player tracking is helping us do that. So the one example we talked about yesterday was uh, sacks. And we have an 
alternate metric called sacks created. So a lot of times what will happen is a pass rusher will generate pressure, force the quarterback to spill out of the pocket, and just run right into the arms of the defensive end. And the defensive end gets credit for that, and he gets the escalator in his contract right. and everything, and, and that defensive tackle is like, oh, well. But he really made that play happen. And, and so we can start to measure that. So even though he doesn't get the sack, we'll say, that's a sack created for you. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to start to be able to do those sorts of things. Affecting the quarterback's the most important thing a defensive lineman can do. What these guys can do nowadays is utterly amazing. And, 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 and I have a big brother complex, okay? Like, I think everybody's watching me all the time. I don't even trust my phone, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and these guys, these guys are quantifying everything. And then what becomes the temptation is to try to tell your players all the stuff that they know, okay? No, don't. don't. It, 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 you can't. I mean, yeah, you can't. You can't. I mean, it, it, uh, okay, and, okay, there's a 20% chance they're going to do this. There's a 50% chance they're going to do that. And don't forget, there's a 5% chance they might do that. Well, I mean, nobody can, nobody can go there and trigger with a rocket up their ass and blow up the ball carrier if, if you're sitting there thinking about 5%, you see. And, 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 and um, you know, the, and so, so, because there's, there, there, I think there's, uh, there's, there's knowledge, and then there's applicable knowledge. Well, your players need applicable knowledge, and, 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 um, and this does not have to do with any question or anything like that. But I'm fascinated by this vision, you know, guy's vision. Okay, okay. So now, the quarterback, you know, what they're able to see, some can see more. Okay, I coached Wes Welker. Okay, Wes Welker um, is five foot eight and he runs a four eight. Okay, now he is quick coming out of his cuts, but nobody could see the field like he could. He was great at seeing the field. And I have a theory, and I thought about this for two years. For two years, I sat there sitting at my desk and, because, you know, you think yeah, everybody sees somebody at the game thinks it's fun and exciting. Hell no, you're in a dark room with fast food, chewing tobacco and coffee. Okay, and going like this all the time. Okay, and I'm thinking, how is it he can see the field? Okay, now Wes was all state soccer. And I'm thinking, okay, now, in, in, I don't like watching soccer, but I, you know, I liked playing soccer. You know, if my kids played soccer, I'd have to bring a magazine, but and try not to get busted. Okay, but, but, but. But if I'm sitting here with a soccer ball, which one of my buddies am I going to kick this to and having to see like that, and now all of a sudden that ball's in my arm, my vision's pretty good. Is this sort of like the Steve Nash theory where he was a soccer player and people think I'll tell you what, I, think, I really think that, because anybody, even in PE, if you played soccer, which that's the extent of my soccer experience, that's great at PE soccer. Okay, so then, and, 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 and you're sitting there with the ball here. You know, which one of my buddies am I going to kick it to? And, and, and then all of a sudden, he could really, 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 really see the field. My latest kind of deal, my latest deal is vision and how can you develop that. And I don't, I don't, I don't know how to. I mean, these guys... These guys here are brilliant, and, um, and I, you know, they're, they're both famous. I mean, in the back rooms of football, they're both famous for the, the quality work they do. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know either of them very well, but, you know, you're, you're sitting there in staff meetings in the dark room. You know damn well that these guys are at the top of their field. And, um, you know, of the, I, my latest thing that I'm thinking about is a guy's vision and how that's trained. And um, uh, because I, I, I've, you know, <clears throat> when Wes played for me, starting when he was a freshman, and he started every game that he ever played at, at, at Texas Tech, all-time leading receiver, you know, at the time. Like a thousand Michael, yards each year, right? Until Michael Crabtree broke his record. Great punt returner. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. Uh, college for, uh, he lead, 4-8, okay, 4-8, leaves college football, all-time leading uh, um, punt returner in the history of college football. I mean, 
And a lot of it had to do with vision because uh, we, we had faster people at every position. There are a lot of no there are some interesting notions about sp sport background as a middle school or high school right. and how that flows yeah. into ability as a pro. So there are theories about playing baseball and judging fly balls. There are theories about being a basketball player. Um, I think it's hard to you know it's hard to see to bear those out in the when you aggregate the data and look at it. Um, but I think we've seen some of those similar theories in basketball. And then even with vision though, like we can see a receiver has good vision, but that has differential value on the outside versus the inside. But I want inside. to teach it. I want to know how to teach yeah. it. Yeah, see, we, I, I would think more like Wes, his, the value of vision to Wes is so high because he's playing in the slot and you're interacting with linebackers and safeties and the margins between nickels and passing defender. Vision has much more value there than if you're an outside receiver telling you run by this guy, you know? I want to, we don't have a ton of time, but kind of talk about something you mentioned, which is you talked about the statistics we're trying to get at that basically... Um, are better and smarter and capture the things that are actually happening on the football field. And you said something, which, don't tell the players. Uh, you said don't tell the player that, or, unless it's a Oh, no, you can't. You, you well, know, but I want to stay there for a second. Fluttered minds make slow legs, you know. Because, uh, first of all, I think Jadavian Clowney would very much like to hear that uh, his, his, I guess, production is being captured on the football field. And I think of something like when we watch games and – a coach goes for two, and the announcers say, well, the analytics told him to go for two, instead of communicating it, I think, more clearly and saying, well, they're, they're playing for a win, or then they'll have more information the next time they go around about it. And I, and I wonder, perhaps, if there's a better way to communicate the utility and application of some of the things we're talking about. Two play are you talking about two players? Or players, two or to the public, yeah. quite frankly. I would, I would keep, like, I agree with... Coach, like uh, you don't want to burden the players with probabilities, and like, that's not the point. You don't right. quiz them on. Uh, there's there's a coach from Cleveland many years ago who did that, and it didn't work out. And um, <clears throat> that's not the role. So the, those probabilities, those things can go to somebody in the booth, who then can just translate that to the to the coordinator or to the co head coach and say, you know, red, yellow, green, like you guys do, and it keeps it very simple. Um, now, yeah, I'm sure Jadavian Clowney would love to know how, you know, we're, we're measuring his actual production, um, but that's, just, that's an off-field kind of conversation. Sure. You don't want to do that during, during the games, definitely. That's not, analytics people, we enjoy this stuff, it's fun for us for its own sake, but we don't want players loaded with that. Look, Coach, what is your decision making when you go for it? Because, um, and now we'll go back to the Ravens, right? It basically, it's like whatever NFL team goes for it a lot is the analytics team. Alex, I was your team. A couple of years ago during your Super Bowl run, now it's Baltimore. You are uh, more aggressive than a lot of coaches. On what? No. In terms of just going for it on fourth. <laughs> oh, on fourth down. <clears throat> is there, I mean, just walk us through how no, that goes. No, I'll, I'll tell you what. You guys are all going to walk out of the room when you hear this now. <laughs> uh, 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 um, first of all, I should probably consult with these two guys here. Yeah, that's, he's got a sign there, and then and then and then um, uh, so the uh, I feel like a total failure. I feel like half a failure if I kick a field goal. I feel like a total failure if I punt, and I'm an offensive coach. I feel like a total failure if I punt. Yeah, so you're thinking about it the right way. That's and, 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 and so then I'm thinking, okay, fourth down. Maybe I can get a lifeline, you know, because I don't hold myself quite as responsible despite the fact I went for it on fourth down if we make it and we get to keep going, okay? And so, so it's a very, uh, and, and, and I've had to use timeouts before sitting there on the sideline on, third, uh, on fourth down going, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? But, uh, uh, but the quick answer is, is... Don't do that, by the way, because the timeout might be more valuable than the difference between field goal goal. So make your decision on third down. <laughs> well, 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 well. And don't use a timeout, please. I'll, 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 I'll tell you this. That though. one's free. Sometimes, <laughs> so, sometimes if you have a real read on the defense and, and, and just because you didn't get it on third down... Uh, um, if you have a real feel for it, even if it's third long, 
your probability is fairly high if you really have a sense of what they're doing and where they're at. And, and I'll tell you the other thing, and, and this is hard to measure because I believe in going forward on fourth down, um, is sometimes the, the, what do you call it, the karma, the momentum the, oh uh, of your team. <laughs> I love this moment. Well, I, I mean, uh, of, of your team is such that your chances are higher. I mean, just uh, the whole group chemistry, everybody thinking the same thing at the same time, you can almost feel a little bit on the sideline, you know, if you're sort of together on it. And I know it sounds instinctual. I know it doesn't do the number thing. You're right. They are going to walk out. <laughs> but what, you go. Okay. You do a lot of the things that the nerds we love. You do, I was just, the reasons are a little different. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you know, but the thing is, is, is as a coach, you do have a sense if your guys are playing well. And they, it, you know, the yeah. results not, may not be well, it, 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 what you'd like, but you have a sense if you're playing well and everybody's firing on all cylinders. That's a good uh, time to go for it on fourth down. If they're not, um, you know, try to get that kind of the energy back. Because I do believe that collective energy is a big thing. I mean, it's different than an individual sport. Collective energy with, uh, you know, your side of the ball simultaneous is, is something real. And I get a kick out of these guys that say, there's no such thing as momentum, baloney. I mean, these are people, they're not spark plugs. And, 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 and I was, um, I used to, you know, offensive coordinators are supposed to be up top. I've, I was up top for uh, three games and I hated it. I've never been up top since. And part of it though, as I started out coaching offensive line, what I don't like about being up top is it looks like a video game. Okay, now you can see better, but the thing is you're pr uh, during practice, you're on the sideline all the time seeing from there. Okay, but what I didn't like is I didn't feel like I was in touch with the emotions and the anxieties of the team, because this is still a game played by people. And uh, somebody's up, you got to relax him. Somebody's down, you got to pick him up. And all that collectively impacts your effort, I think. You got to measure that too, because I'd like to know those. I mean, I can. It's zero. Uh, well, well but, but there may be a way. I'm only kidding. Don't no. sell yourself short because this business didn't even exist 20 years ago. You know? Yeah, no, I know that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the question about momentum is whether it's a cause or effect. And I also agree that it, the numbers shouldn't make the final decision. So the analyst should arm, arm the coach, the decision maker, kind of with the relevant information. And then the coach is always going to have information uh, that, that's external to the model, right? That he knows who's hurt, you know, who's playing well, who's having a good day, you know, where the injuries are, is the field wet, and everything like that. So you just arm the coach with, with good information, and, and the coach always should be making yeah. the decision. And also the actual players are factored in to, I think there's sometimes a misconception that um, analytically inclined decision-making doesn't actually reflect the abilities of the players on the field. No, Alec, like yeah. speak to that. Well, I was, I was going to say earlier, too, that I think we were talking about not giving stuff to players. And I, there's obviously what you communicate to a coordinator will be different than what you would want that coordinator to communicate to a player. But I do think there's a lot of variation in how data-driven players are, and many of them <laughs> are very, very data-driven. They may not call themselves data-driven. That may not be the term they would use, but they think in terms of in terms of numbers and the likelihood that something happens. And I do think even in, in terms of measuring their own performance, fundamentally, they just want the numbers that are generated in the box score to match the actual, to match the reality on the field and what they actually did. So like when a defensive lineman is upset that they didn't get credit for how much they were pressuring the quarterback, it's because they know that something isn't showing, there's a gap between the zero sacks and the half a dozen times that they were, were in their face. So I think a lot of them are like, they would like that stuff if it if it aligns more with reality and they feel like it tells them the story about what they contributed then then they're good with it well i did not do a good job managing the clock i apologize we are out of time but thank you so much guys i really appreciate it all right thank you <laughs>